As a poet, he was someone who spoke from a deeper place. He called it utterance. And I think that that's the you the dream is talking to also. And the dream, in fact, came to show you this you because you've forgotten it. And maybe more, the dreams are telling you that in order for you to be you, the poet, the man at the breakfast table has to die so you can be the real you. And I think our dreams are fatal in just that way. Um, James Hillman says somewhere that dreams come from the point of view of your death. That's true. Um, certainly the first dream story in Genesis illustrates that. It's the dream of Abimelech, and that's really the first gift, the warning dream. Abimelech is a petty king, and Avram and Sarai come to visit. Abimelech thinks Sarai is pretty cute, decides to take her to bed. And um, something very strange in the story, by the way, is that he falls asleep before sex. Usually it doesn't work that way. Uh, so he has a dream. And he hears something that nobody wants to hear in a dream. God appears to him in a dream, we're told, in a very straightforward way. This is the dream theory of Genesis. God appears to us in our dreams and speaks to us in our dreams. That's what it says. And God says something we probably don't want to hear. You are a dead man. <laughs> you are a dead man. And uh, Abimelech says, why? He says, because of the woman you've taken with you. He says, but he said it was his sister. God said, that's why I didn't let you touch her. But, so Abimelech does something remarkable. And if you compare this dream story to, say, the stories you find in the Near East, like in Babylonia or Samaria, here's the difference. In Babylonia or Samaria, if you dream, if the gods say you're dead, that means you die. That's it. No reprieve. But in this Genesis story, um, Abimelech gets a chance to change his ways. In other words, the dream shows us an image of our behavior. If you're lying in your dream, do you lie when you're awake? If you steal in your dream, are you stealing when you're awake? If you act hypocritically in your dream, is that what you do when you're awake? You know, I dreamed, um, this, you'll hate me after I tell you this dream, but I dreamed that, um, there was a group of people and they were in wheelchairs and I was very solicitous and came over and invited them to have tea with me, hoping they would turn me down, because I really didn't want to. And when they said yes, I weaseled out of it. How could you not take a dream like that seriously? How could you not look at a dream like that as a message, a warning about how you behave and who you are? This is something dreams do in a very powerful way. They show us how we behave. And that's the first teaching I learned. And it was hard. It was very hard. But I had a good teacher. He was pretty hard on me. And the second gift of the dream is to show us our essence. And Rabbi Gordon gave us that dream also, uh, the Joseph dream. He dreams, you know, we learn that Joseph is not very well liked by his brothers. I think the text says they hated him. Uh, <laughs> pretty blunt, isn't it? And uh, he dreams that they're gathering sheaves. Does everyone know what a sheave is? I didn't really know what a sheaf was, but basically you take wheat and you bundle it. And so his sheaves are standing upright, which is pretty hard to do if you can imagine the sheaves of wheat, right? And all the other sheaves are flopping over, bowing down to his sheep. And his brothers interpret the dream, as Zohar says, they're the first dream interpreters in Torah. And the brothers say, basically, I'll translate into it, contemporary language, who the hell do you think you are? Um, you think you're going to rule over us? And Jacob gets in the act and basically says the same thing. 
So they interpret the dream as though Joseph were an egotistical person who was vainglorious, and they had this dream in order to show his great wish for ruling over his brothers. Which, if you think about it, makes zero sense. In other words, we have adopted the invidious and envious interpretation of Joseph's brothers instead of looking at the real meaning of the dream, which Joseph himself does not understand. Joseph does not interpret this dream. That's very important. He waits 22 years, and when his brothers come to Egypt and Joseph is not clear, they don't know who he is, he's in disguise, and they bow down to him, he remembers this dream. And now he knows what it means. The rabbis say you should wait 22 years before you interpret a dream um, to see if it comes to realization. Which I think I would modify that to say we should be patient with our dreams and let them soak in and not be so quick to jump in with our interpretation. Or to try to feel what the dream means. And I think that... Um, What I learned from the work with Mark Regman is that dreams can show us our essence or our soul. In Joseph's case, it's a, a symbolic dream, but more often in the work we do, it's the appearance of the child. It's the appearance of a baby or a child that shows us who we are and who we're meant to be. So that we call that the essence dream. Um, the third thing to the dream is Jacob's dream of the ladder. Jacob's dream of the ladder. And there really are two parts to that dream in my mind. The dream and his reaction. The dream itself we know. Jacob's on the run. He's cheated his brother. He's run away from home. He's run away from who he is. He falls asleep in a barren place which puts his head on a rock. And he dreams of a ladder between earth and heaven, angels running up and down the ladder. He sees God at the top of the ladder. And in this dream, he hears something we do want to hear from God in the dream, which is, I am with you, I will be with you wherever you go. What a wonderful thing. What a powerful experience. And um, he wakes. And he says things have changed. He says, this place is awesome. Just like the kids say, right? Hey, it's awesome here. Manura, Hamakoma said, how awesome is this place? And then he says, God was in this place and I didn't know it. God was in this place and I didn't know it. Now I want to point out something. He doesn't need a dream interpreter. He doesn't need a dream therapist. He doesn't need a dream worker. He doesn't need a dream book. He just needs to feel what he's experienced, which is the awesome. And you'd think that would be a great dream, unlike Abu Melech's, right? It is a great dream, but Jacob's reaction to the dream is also significant. He has a very hard time accepting the awesome, because the awesome means you have to be who you're meant to be. You have to find your essence. It also means you have to die to your old self in order to become something new. And he doesn't want to do that. So he builds an altar and he makes a vow. He basically says, God, if you do such and such for me, I'll do such and such for you. He makes a contract. And the rabbis note and say that Jacob vowed and lost. He vowed and lost because he lost the gift of the dream. He didn't need to make a deal. He already had everything. What more do you need than I am with you? But it shows that we struggle just as much with the spiritual experiences we have in our dreams as we struggle with the bad news of our dreams. It's not just the pain of our dreams that show us our faults, but also the opening in our dreams that show us our real dimension. We don't really 